Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Caffeinate for Wednesday, April the 4th. Oh my gosh, it's already Wednesday. That's insane. I hope you guys are doing very well today. Uh, of course, as you can tell if you're watching live, we are on Mixer.com trying out some new things. Uh, I said that I was going to be experimenting with different kinds of platforms over the course of the next few months, and lo and behold, we are. Uh, you know, I thought that I would just try something new, so if you want to watch live, for the next uh, couple of weeks at least, I'll be trying things out over here on Mixer.com slash Samuel Adams, and yes... I actually did end up nailing that URL, actually. That is mine. I, it's not belonging to the beer company, uh, which is very surprising. But for those that are not accustomed to the podcast, this is pretty much a morning show that I do every single weekday morning at 7 a.m., uh, where I go through the top video game news of the past 24 hours because that's the kind of stuff that we would talk about over here. It's just super fun. Uh, gives you everything you need to know to get through your nerdy kind of day. And uh, today we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine stories. The ninth one is kind of up in the air. It's not really a, a real story. It's kind of something I wanted to promote because it is a platform that I am passionate about. So I thought that I would go ahead and throw that out there for you guys if you did want to check it out. Uh, but for those that are watching on YouTube.com slash Samuel Adams Media, thank you very much. You guys are the real MVP. I appreciate that. And uh, for anyone else that's just kind of finding this on Online. Thanks for taking the time to listen to what I have to say and uh, to hang out during the morning show. Um, but with all of that self-promotion stuff out of the way, let's go ahead and dive into the news, which is actually beginning on a rather somber note, an unfortunate one. There was a shooting yesterday at YouTube's headquarters, and this story is coming to us from the New York Times, I thought. Uh, but apparently we are going to be going to this, hold on, uh, YouTube headquarters. Excuse me. I pulled up the wrong story. That was unfortunate. Uh, 
try that in New York Times. Because that was the best version of the article that I found. Uh, that looks pretty good. Here we go. Uh, this is what I was wanting. Uh, shooting at YouTube um, offices wounds three. The suspect is dead. A woman opened fire with a handgun at YouTube's headquarters in California on Tuesday afternoon, shooting three people, one of whom was critically injured. Before killing herself, the authorities said uh, the San Bernardino Police Department identified the attacker late Tuesday as Nassim Svagdam, I believe, who was in her late 30s. Uh, who cares about her name? She shot up a, a place with people in it. No one should ever publicize the name. That's what they want. Uh, the motivation for the shootings was under investigation, the police said, although her social media postings include criticisms of YouTube. Uh, Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital received three patients, a man, 36, in critical condition, a woman, 32, in serious condition, and a woman, 27, in fair condition, a hospital spokesman, Brent Andrews, said at a news conference. A fourth person had injuries that weren't from a gunshot. Uh, the police said at this time there is no evidence that the shooter knew the victims of the shooting or that the individuals were specifically targeted, the San Bruni, uh, Bruno Police Department said in a written statement. Uh, so that's essentially the bulk of the story. There was a shooting yesterday at the YouTube headquarters. Of course, if you want to read the rest of the story, everything is linked on YouTube down below in the, um, in the description box, as well as on Mixer, if I could do that on the past broadcast section. Uh, but with that being said, uh, very unfortunate news. There is never a time in in any kind of way, shape, or form where it is, you know, a good thing to hear about somebody that is uh, that has gotten so low and has gotten to a point in their lives where they choose to shoot up a uh, a location, a business where where business is held. You know, it's just a very sad and unfortunate situation, and so. Uh, you have to kind of just take a step back and, and, and think about that, really. But when it comes down to it, there were, uh, there were no deaths of any kinds of victims, only, the, only the, um, the shooter herself, which is, I suppose, the, the good piece of news that can come out of all of this. Obviously, there isn't much good news that can come out of this situation. Uh, but it's very interesting to me to look at this and see the reasoning behind it. Other reports uh, have had interviews with the father of the uh, of the shooter who has said that she was very uh, frustrated with YouTube. She said that it essentially ruined her livelihood because she had four YouTube channels and a couple of other social media accounts, but essentially they all got uh, either banned or deleted or their monetization got stripped, uh, as mine did on YouTube a couple of months back and so she felt very um cheated she felt very uh, hostile towards youtube and so when taking that into account she just kind of went ahead and went off the deep end i suppose which is very unfortunate uh with that being said again the best case scenario is essentially what happened here we have you know uh the only victim there are the only real, you know, life lost is the one that was taking lives. Uh, so with that being said, I just wanted to give my, uh, you know, my condolences to those that are uh, impacted by this event over there on on, uh, on the California coast. And, of course, Donald Trump reached out, gave thoughts and prayers. Appreciate it, DT, uh, you know, is what it is. Anyways, moving along to the next story, which is on a lighter note. The Spider-Man PS4 release date will be revealed very, very soon. Release date is inbound. The story comes to us from GameSpot, uh, but of course there is no real release date within the article itself. The last we heard, Insomniac said that its new Spider-Man game will launch on PlayStation 4 at some point in 2018, but when exactly will it come out? This year. We'll know soon, apparently. According to Insomniac, the game's release date will be announced tomorrow, April 4th, as part of the magazine Game Informer's May issue, which May 4th is today. So we'll have a release date tomorrow. Now, the release date will apparently be announced when Game Informer's digital issue for May goes live at 8 a.m. Pacific Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. Uh, Game Informer's new issue will have details on the new Spider-Man game's open world, its missions, side quests, and collectibles. The magazine is also promising new information on the game's controls and combat, as well as upgrades and customization like suit crafting. The magazine will also confirm the names of the villains in the game. In all, the magazine will have 14 pages dedicated to the new Spider-Man game. Uh, keep checking out with GameSpot to find out the game's release date and more details as they are announced. We will wait for the release date. You... While we wait for the release date, excuse me, you can check out some brand new Spider-Man PS4 gameplay footage right here, and there's a link to that. Uh, this is exciting stuff. This is a uh, a big, big game for 2018 because you have um, Insomniac really bringing what they've got to the table. They're really, really going hard uh, with Spider-Man. I think that this is a big change for the company because traditionally they've done things uh, like Ratchet & Clank. Traditionally they've done things like, I believe they were the people behind Resistance. Resistance developers 
Yes, Insomnia Games did Resistance. So they've done things like Ratchet and Clank. They've done Resistance. Uh, on top of that, they've also done, I believe, a Sunset Overdrive a couple of years back on the Xbox One, which was a big news story back then uh, because Insomnia had traditionally been kind of a PlayStation oriented company. There weren't really too many variations of that. Uh, and so, as time has gone on, Insomniacs obviously come back over to PlayStation because the Spider-Man game is a PlayStation 4 exclusive, at least for the time being. I'm not familiar of whether or not it will actually come to other consoles. I haven't heard anything about it uh, coming to another platform, but it is going to be an awesome game because I've checked out the gameplay, I've seen what's going on at E3, and the open world this, this Spider-Man game affords is something that I feel every Spider-Man game or every superhero game should have. Whenever you are playing in a world as Spider-Man, whenever you are taking on the persona of a masked superhero, that is the time whenever you need to be able to just go all out, explore, see what's going on in different parts of the city, town, whatever you might be you know, experiencing. You need to be able to just wander around and really do the crime fighting thing, and that's exactly what we're going to be getting uh, within this new Spider-Man game if previous gameplay is anything to go off of. Uh, it'll be cool to see all of the new details. I'm probably not going to be delving too far into it, uh, both on Caffeinate and in my own personal life, because that kind of takes away from the entire experience of diving into the game after it comes out. I don't like looking at all of the new information that comes out about a game, because I like to experience it for myself, you know what I mean? And so, you know, as time goes on, will I eventually find more information about this? Will it eventually come across my feed and I'll be like, oh, there's that villain and there's that Easter egg and things along those lines? Probably. Uh, but I cannot wait to see when the release date is uh, set for. Uh, it could be very, very soon. It could be later on in the fall. I suppose we'll know in about four hours from the recording of this video. And I cannot wait to share that with you guys. We will talk about it tomorrow on tomorrow morning's episode of Caffeinate for Thursday. Uh, and I'm sure it might even be the headliner unless something crazy happens like, like yesterday. But, um, we will see how that all goes. Of course, Game Informer is one of the oldest, um, you know, publishings as far as gaming journalism goes. They do a great job over at Game Informer. They're not quite as biased as I feel they used to be. Uh, of course, Game Informer is owned at least partially or in full by uh, by GameSpot or GameStop, excuse me. So I was kind of hesitant to always trust what they had to say. But with that being said, they always do pretty good reporting. And so we will see what goes on with that Spider-Man release date. Hopefully it's very, very soon because we need something. We need something. The next story comes to us from Polygon. The Pokemon Go Fest lawsuit will cost Niantic $1.58 million more. A uh, class action settlement will reimburse attendees travel expenses, which is absolutely insane. On May 25th, 2018, Pokemon Go players who attended the disastrous festival in Chicago's Grant Park in the summer of 2017 will get a very unusual alert on their smartphones. Each of the more than 18,000 attendees will be offered the opportunity to go to a website, submit their receipts, and receive reimbursement for their travel expenses. It's all thanks to a settlement reached in a class action lawsuit against the game's developer, Niantic. If users have the Pokemon Go app installed and allow for push notifications, they'll receive a court mandate offering to re offer, wait, offer directing them to a website for further information. Users must have registered for Pokemon Go Fest through the app. Most will also receive an email. If they follow the process, they should have their share of the $1.58 million settlement by November. Polygon spoke with attorney Thomas Zimmerman, who argued on behalf of his clients, Jonathan Norton and Kenneth J. Flesher. Nailed it. In the case, Zimmerman said that by no means was this a slam dunk. With 18,771 people, you would expect that there would be a lot more suits, uh, Zimmerman told Polygon. But nobody else filed because of the case law that uniformly dismisses these complaints. Uh, when you buy a ticket to an event, Zimmerman said you're simply buying a license to your witness that event. If the Cubs don't play well, for example, you're not entitled to get your money back. It's called a disappointed expectation, Zimmerman said. If you're disappointed in the outcome of an event, that's not what you bought. You didn't buy a ticket to see an event that you were going to enjoy. You bought a ticket to see an event, and you got an event. The concept of the disappointed ex expectation was in the news recently when a similar lawsuit involving a fight between boxers Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather in May of 2015. Uh, that's unrelated. Even under that situation, uh, thing, okay, so essentially what it comes down to. Uh, people are getting their money back because of what happened with Pokemon Go. Essentially, for those that don't know, there was this giant event going on in Chicago in the summer of last year, and they went, and it was just a slew of of inability to connect. There was no real, there was no real. It was kind of like the Fire Festival of Pokemon Go. And for those that don't know what the Fire Festival is, oh man, oh man, you have missed something. The Fire Festival was essentially this giant. Uh, almost Coachella-esque event as it was built up, and eventually just before the final, you know, time to go live and, and do the event, 
every artist bailed. They realized that there were no real luxurious tents as they have been described. And essentially the fire festival was nothing more than people sitting in the middle of a field with no no music, uh, little to no food, a really, really bad uh, tent. It was essentially a, uh, a refugee tent and a refugee living. It was a very strange festival, and that's pretty much what we had with Pokemon Go's uh, Pokemon Go Fest. So it's good to hear that people are getting their money back. It's pretty crazy to hear that only two people sued. I expected way more than that. Um, however, you can't expect too much because obviously a company like Niantic probably has enough money to buy a good many lawyers to take care of their needs. And so that's kind of where we're left over on that end. But um, it's interesting to hear the perspective of the the um, attorney himself. And it's very interesting to see how this is all turning out. Because I didn't think that anybody would actually get anything back uh, from the failure that was Pokemon Go Fest. And so good luck to all of you who are trying to get your money back. Uh, I wish you the best. And uh, we'll see how that ends up going for you. But uh, obviously, you have to have receipts, you have to have proof that you bought these things, you have to pr have proof of travel, etc. So, good luck, again. And moving along to the next story, which is coming to us from Game Rant over there on, uh, on G GameRant.com. I don't know why I did that transition. Uh, by AG, AJ Plots, Chrono Trigger on PC will offer retro graphics mode. Uh, the PC port of classic RPG Chrono Trigger has had its share of issues since launch. Most notably, fans were upset that it was a port of the mobile version, which had its own problems instead of the DS version. The team behind the port did announce today they are taking steps to resolve those issues, as well as add some more options for the game. Announced on Chrono Trigger's Steam page, there was a quick update on what is being worked on, and when fans can expect the patches to come out. The post addressed the fact that there had been a fan outcry about issues with the port, and that those issues are being worked on, which will take a few patches to fully iron out. The first of those patches will release at some point later this month on top of starting to resolve some of the problems with the port it will also add the option to switch between the high resolution graphics and the game's classic snes graphics um Yes. The team also stated in the update they will release detailed notes with each patch going over what was fixed in said patch. Fans were also thankful, or were also thanked, excuse me, uh, for providing feedback on the port as well as being patient while the issues are resolved. The original game, which was released by Square Enix all the way back on the SNES, became an instant classic with its time traveling tale and engaging combat system, and it is, in fact, a classic. It has been ported many times over the years, including the aforementioned DS version and a PS1 version as well. With it being originally released on the SNES, it was baffling that it wasn't an included title on the Super NES Classic that came out last year. On top of the regular edition that released on Steam for $14.99, there was also a limited edition that included downloadable music and PC wallpapers. I've never understood why any developer would include PC wallpapers as part of an incentive. Do you not realize that I could literally Google Chrono Trigger wallpapers and have a slew of them? at my disposal within seconds but that's beside the point we will continue on uh, that edition was only available until April 2nd, but due to the issues and the fact that patches will be coming out over the next few months, the team behind the port has decided to extend the availability of the limited edition until April 30th. Uh, Chrono Trigger is now available for PC through Steam. So, whenever this game came out, it was a really, really big failure when it comes down to it. Everybody was expecting a genuine port of the original version of Chrono Trigger, and lo and behold, that's not what they got at all. They got this really bad mobile port that was brought over to PC that ran well, but it was essentially a mobile port. There was nothing significant about it. There was nothing impressive about it. It was just a mobile port. And um, as time has gone on, it seems like the interest around the project has faded, which is unfortunate. You know, I will admit it is a very unfortunate thing to see, but it's one that is deserved. You know, whenever you bring a, uh, a huge game like Chrono Trigger over to the PC and you give them the mobile version of the game, you should expect some criticism. You should expect some, some hit back. And they, in fact, didn't get a lot of hit back. So to see them making an effort to adjust what's going on with Chrono Trigger, to see them making it better overall, that's something that I like to see. You know, it's good to, whenever somebody makes a, a solid, genuine effort. And I hope the best for the game. I hope the best for the fans because genuinely the fans do deserve something much better than what they got with the Chrono Trigger release on PC. Will it end up turning out? I highly doubt it. I think that at its very core, it doesn't matter how many patches come out from the devs. I don't think it matters how many changes are made. Unless they completely and totally rework this entire game and make it into a genuine port, this is all just going to be lived down and, and remembered as a mobile port that was brought to PC. That's what it comes down to. I don't think there is anything else that has to be said about this. If you don't bring the full version of the game, you aren't going to be getting the respect of the full version of the game. I'm sorry. That's how it is. You can you can hit me up on Twitter at Pretty Chill Guy if you have something else to say. But by all means, this is kind of how I perceive this entire game. So, 
Uh, will you be buying it? Let me know. Uh, hit me up on Anchor if you want to fill me in on that. If you want to give me a uh, drop me a line over there on YouTube, wherever you might be watching this, let me know if you guys are going to be getting this because fourteen ninety nine. I mean, that's cheap, but for a mobile game that's on PC, eh, I don't know. Um, or the limited edition. You guys are going to be getting that April thirtieth? Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, moving along to another story by Game Rant. God of War file size is pretty large. This comes to us from, again, AJ Plotz. He was busy yesterday with God of War's release day drawing close. More information has been coming out regarding the title. One piece of information recently recently revealed its game file size, which looks to be nearly as epic as the game itself. Uh, the install size for God of War comes in at just under 45 gigabytes. I believe I saw 40, uh, 46.4 Something along those lines, 49.4, something like that, uh, which has been seen before on some more recent titles. This file size may not be worrisome for some gamers who have a larger internal hard drive or, which I think is the better option, have an external hard drive for their PS4. But those who still have a 500 gig one may need to delete some games to make space for God of War. For those who are looking to upgrade their PS4 or pick one up for the first time, a limited edition PS4 Pro is coming out for the game as well. It is worth noting that file size for both physical and retail copies as wait physical and digital there that was a weird way to word that come on aj come on what are you doing man now, the title, which moved the series out of Greek mythology and into the frigid setting of Norse mythology, is set to release later this month. The new setting is not only the thing is not the only thing to change with the newest game either, as this entry sees Kratos going on a quest with his son in tow. Kratos has also ditched his chain of blades in favor of a more Nordic-themed weapon, the Leviathan Axe. What a weapon that is, by the way. I saw a uh, replica of it at Target last weekend. The thing is huge. I don't know if it's actually built to scale. I doubt it, but it looks very, very interesting. So... Uh, moving along, you know, change in scenery, it's got more storytelling, that's what they're going to be saying. God of War will be available on April 20th, 2018, exclusively for the PlayStation 4, and also there is this little bit that we talked about a couple of days ago where there's going to be a performance mode on the PlayStation 4 Pro for God of War, which will allow you to kind of change up how the game is is run on the PS4. Uh, you can either have, you know, the game running very, very well at 1080p 60, supposedly. Some people have said 30. I'm hoping 60. We'll see what happens with gameplay. I'm sure that Digital Foundry uh, will release some updated information as well, uh, talking about what that actually does, but um, you have the performance mode where you can choose 4K 30, etc., or or maybe 1080 solid 30. Who knows what's going to happen with that? Um, but that is going to be an option. So uh, that's pretty much what you've got. So if you have a PlayStation 4 and you want to pick up God of War, which is coming again on April the 20th, then you should probably free up some space if you have that 500 gig because 46 or 45 gigabytes, excuse me, is a, essentially a tenth of your system. And of course, you have your OS. You have a couple of other things that are taking up some space on your hard drive. You need to be prepared. Uh, for when this game does end up coming out. Oh, hello. How are we doing this morning? We have a new follow. Appreciate that follow. Welcome to the brewery, my friend. Welcome to the brewery. For those audio listeners later after the podcast has finished, uh, that's a Mixer follow. So follow over on Mixer.com slash Samuel Adams. Much appreciated. Um, but yes, if you have a PlayStation 4, then by all means, you need to check out and see if you have enough room to put this on your hard drive. It's a big thing. It's a big deal. Go ahead and give it a look. Uh, moving along to a story from PC Gamer, the global authority on PC games. HTC Price's Vive Pro Starter Kit bundle for new VR entrance at $1,099. The Starter Kit comes with a headset, two controllers, and two base stations. Uh, this has come to us from Paul Lilly over there, again, at PC Gamer. Uh, HTC today provided clarity on the cost of purchasing all the necessary hardware minus a PC to use its Vive Pro headset. For anyone who is not upgrading from the original Vive and therefore doesn't already own touch controllers and base stations, HTC will offer a Starter Kit bundle for $1,099 beginning on April the 5th. The starter kit pairs the upgraded Vive Pro headset with two Vive 1.0 controllers and two base stations, uh, neither of which are included with the $799 headset purchased as a bundle. You're essentially paying $300 for the base stations and controllers. If purchased separately, they would run about $530. So for those that don't do the math, it's a difference of about $230. HTC's pricing is definitely on the pre uh, premium end of the spectrum, even when factoring in the high resolution. The cost of VR has always been one of the main barriers, and with HTC pricing its bundle at over a grand, that is probably not going to change for new VR entrants wanting the newest stuff. And there's another, the other rub, the base stations and controllers are both first generation products. Not good. According to Upload VR, second generation models are expected to release later this year. HTC hinted at this on its blog. Uh, they say, quote, we've got more in store soon for the full 2.0 Vive Pro kits, but it was important to us for us to get this out as quickly as possible. I bet it was because you wanted to get everything out of your store, you know, because you don't want to have those 1.0 setups. 
whenever the new one comes out. So go ahead and throw them up in a bundle, and there you go. Uh, what the Vibe Pro brings to the table is a higher resolution and more comfortable design compared to the original Vibe. HTC upgraded the resolution to 2880 by 1660 uh, versus the original's 2160 by 2160 res and made it fit better. Uh, Chris had a chance to play with the Vive Pro and notes that it fits much better over his glasses. While it wasn't blown away by the upgraded resolution, the comfort level has improved appreciably over the previous model. Check out his write-up for more thoughts on the headset. Uh, so essentially, you're saving a couple of bucks if you want to get into VR. Uh, Archie in the chat, I'm going to call you Archie, I, so I, I'm, I apologize. Archie Majerus. Perhaps. I apologize. Love the concept of the channel. Can't wait to see more. Appreciate that, man. I apologize for completely butchering your name. But hey, you're a cool guy. Thanks for the follow. Um, with this, as somebody who doesn't dive into VR very often, as somebody who doesn't really uh, take part in VR, it's cool to see that there is at least some kind of discount on a couple of different options for getting into the VR space. Of course, if you want to get into VR and you are adamant about getting into it right now, then I would probably recommend the uh, the virtual reality. Uh, Archie in the chat, I'm sorry if I call you Archie, is that okay? Yeah, let me know. He says it's Latin, I believe you. I believe you. But uh, if you want to dive into VR, the best way to do it is through PlayStation VR because you get to taste the forbidden fruit, if you will, of VR. That's kind of the way that I perceive that. And so it's very low entry level for price. It is something that is very accessible in general. And so if you want to throw a couple of bucks into the mix and just experience what PSVR has to offer, uh, then you can experience that and see if it's something you would like to invest more money in. Now, for those that have already tried out VR, for those that want to really put some money behind what VR is bringing to the table, then is that, that that's the point that you get into the HTC and the Vive Pro, etc. So, uh, this is the pinnacle VR experience. Make no mistake, this is a major, major key uh, whenever you're talking about where the future of VR lies. Uh, so, you know, if you want to check it out, then 1099 will get you the entire starter kit, which saves you a couple of hundred bucks, essentially, uh, but you still do need that beefy PC, and I've had a guy in my chat uh, that's actually my mod who has been building one of, uh, one of those gaming VR kind of PCs, and it's going to cost him right around uh, between $800 and $1,100, probably closer to $1,100, so essentially, uh, going off of that price, you're going to need about $2,500 if you include taxes to get into the world of VR. Uh, so, if you have that kind of money to throw around, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, but that's a really, really pricey entry-level point for uh, what you got going on with the HTC Vive Pro. But it's cool to see the technology continuing to push forward. It's cool to see the changes continuing to be made. And so, I'm excited to see where the future does end up lying uh, with this VR kind of technology. And of course, with the Vive Pro. Um, when it comes down to it, I think Vive has the most going for it at the moment. You know, you have Oculus, you have PlayStation VR, you have HTC Vive. And, um, of course, Oculus had a big, huge, um, a big, huge finagle going on with its founder, Palmer Lucky, whenever he was doing stuff with a campaign. You know, we don't talk politics very often on the podcast, on the channel, on YouTube, etc. But, obviously, Palmer Lucky had some run-ins with a couple of... With a couple of unfavorable media media stories that uh, that definitely tarnished his reputation, and he ended up stepping back from the company, and so that kind of put a hold on what Oculus had going on. But they've kind of rebuilt their their um their reputation since then. And then you have PlayStation VR, which is good, but it's the entry level. You know, it is it is running on a PlayStation Four, which is essentially technology from what 2013 at this point. Uh, it's been a hot minute since that was new tech, and or maybe even 2012. It could be 2012. Um. So obviously you have a lot of different things going on with that. And then you have the HTC Vive where they're pumping out things like the Vive Pro where you have the Vive, the original, that is still a quality experience. So um, it's cool to see how these dynamics are changing over time. I still won't be getting into the you know world of VR for a good long while because I don't have any interest in it. I'm happy with my monitors. I'm happy with my 1080p. I'm happy with my 144 hertz because that is where it is smooth as butter, people. Smooth as butter. Um, and so I'm not going to be diving into it anytime soon, but with that being said, you may be into it yourself. Moving along to our next story, coming to us from Destructoid, Shaq, yes, that Shaq, uh, is named the new general manager for Sacramento Kings eSports team. Uh, this story comes to us again from Destructoid by Chris Carter. Uh, season begins in May. This coming May all through August, the Kings guard, the Sacramento Kings real eSports team, will begin competing in the NBA 2K League, comprised of 16 other teams. Now, Shaq has their back. As announced this week, Shaquille O'Neal, who is currently working on Shaq Fu follow-up as we speak, will serve as the the King, um, excuse me, King's Guards 
a uh, weird name, general manager starting today. He's just in time for the draft, which will set at the stage for the rest of the 16-week season. Set the stage. Excuse me. Need some coffee. Delish. Delish. Uh, this move isn't a complete surprise as Shaq has been a minority owner of the Kings since 2013 and he has been consistently talking about upping his game, no pun intended. Uh, when it comes to esports, it was only a matter of time. Uh, that's ex that's exactly, that's all of the, that's, that's the entire story. Uh, so, this is kind of just a fun story that I thought I would throw in because it's interesting to see that somebody as big as Shaquille O'Neal is getting into the world of esports, especially with something like NBA 2K, which it's kind of like um, how he was always such a big basketball star. You would think that he would be into this kind of thing in real life, but lo and behold, he's getting into managing an esports team because I believe he sees the value in what esports are bringing to the table. Now, when it comes down to it, uh, you have so many different kinds of dynamics here because obviously Shaquille O'Neal is a fame, fantastic uh, man with a ton of skill in basketball. Obviously, you know he's gotten older and he's stopped playing so much, um, but he has a ton of skill. He has a ton of knowledge, and to be able to manage an esports team, I think is something that he can do, especially in the world of basketball. And so uh, we'll see what happens. But I do think this speaks volumes to the significance of esports. I think this speaks volumes to how they are going to be changing the competitive landscape over the course of the next decade or so, because more and more people are jumping on this bandwagon and seeing what esports are truly all about, and that is very, very exciting. Now, Archie in the chat says, any comment on the future of Oculus amid the whole Facebook scandal? Great question. Really good question. I appreciate that. Um, amid the entire Facebook scandal, I don't think that they're going to be very impacted by what's going on with Facebook because I feel like in the general perception by the public, more people are going to be focused on what the tech is bringing to the table. Uh, they're going to be more focused on what the Vive, or uh, yes, the Vive, oh, excuse me, the Oculus, I'm sorry. And they're going to be more focused on what VR technology in general, let's put it that way, is bringing to the table and what kind of experiences they can have. Obviously, not many people uh, know that Oculus is owned by Facebook and associated with it in that kind of way. And with that, you have the general public not even being aware of the fact that they're connected. And on top of that, uh, you also have this general misunderstanding that there is, you know, like I said, any kind of connection whatsoever. So, no, I don't think it's going to be connected that much, and I don't think it's going to be impacted that heavily. Uh, but great question, man. Appreciate that. Um, so if you're a fan of Shaq, if you're a fan of Shaq, Shaq, if you're a fan of Shaq, uh, and you want to check out what he's got going on with the, uh, King's Guard, you can check that out starting in May, I believe is what is 16 week season. Yes. Uh, so give that a shot. Give it a look if you want to do that. And finally, alleged PlayStation 5 details do end up surfacing. And, uh, you know, funnily enough, this is our headliner for the week. Uh, some details about the next expected Sony PlayStation console that will supposedly be called the PlayStation 5 has surfaced from a source that has managed to correctly predict slash reveal some details regarding other consoles in the past. Semi-accurate has successfully predicted the Nintendo and NVIDIA partnering for the Nintendo Switch, as well as the specs for the PlayStation 4 in 2012. So these predicted PlayStation 5 specs that semi-accurate list might not be far off. First, the article claims that the PlayStation 5 will be using AMD's next generation Navi GPU, which is said to ship towards the end of 2018 as its base architecture. Not much is known about AMD's next generation Navi GPU yet, but it will apparently deploy a scalable GPU design with many smaller Navi GPU dies uh, interconnected through AMD's superfast Infinity Fabric technology, as well as the mysterious next-gen memory. Uh, the publication also believes PlayStation 5 CPU will be the AMD's Zen processor. Uh, this is just a concept this is not an actual, you know, controller or anything like that. Uh, apparently, large amounts of software development kits, which are early versions of new hardware sent out to developers for preparing new games, have also gone out. This suggests that although it's somewhat unlikely, a 2018 release of PlayStation 5 is not entirely out of the question, though I can almost guarantee you that will not happen. I will eat a sock if we end up getting a PlayStation 5 in 2018. Finally, the source suggests that the PlayStation 5 will have VR goodies, as it has already been taken into account at the Silicon level. While there has been debate over whether Sony could continue to invest in virtual reality, this latest rumor suggests that the company is doubling down on the technology. This could be the biggest detail that either lends credence to the rumor or blows it apart. Some have already started questioning the reliability of this source and say that they would rather wait to hear the PlayStation 5 details announcement from Sony directly. Uh, but when looking at the Xbox One X specs and where the console should go next, these predictions may not be far off. We are hoping to get detailed specs announcements and perhaps a more accurate concrete release date for the PlayStation 5 from Sony in the near future. Again, that comes to us from Game Rant over there by Janine Engelbrecht. Uh, Archie in the chat says, I wonder if any sanctions from abroad as far as a privacy uh, will affect revenue towards uh, advancing Oculus and the longevity of Instagram. Hmm, that's interesting. I wonder if sanctions from abroad 
So you're thinking about it from a completely different perspective than I am as compared to like, you know, I'm just looking at it from the domestic perspective because I'm, I don't know where you're from in the world, but United States is where I'm located. And so uh, in general, that's pretty much the tech hub of where this is all being developed. So I don't know that anything uh, will be impacting everything. Uh, and, and the revenue, I think, is going to be an interesting skew uh, in general because you're going to have so many people buying it, but also so many different people uh, using the tech for different things like learning, uh, education, etc. I think that's going to be a big part of Oculus's future. Uh, and so there are so many different dynamics and things like that. Uh, but the longevity of Instagram, I'm not sure that it will be connected to Oculus Rift in general. It would be cool to see if it is going to impact it. But I like the way you're thinking. You've got some really good ideas. Uh, that's that's a great kind of concept to actually consider. And I would love to see uh, how that would actually affect it because sanctions and things like that are not things that are normally considered. Uh, so good on you for considering that. But uh, with the PlayStation 5, we'll see what happens. Will we see something at E3? More than likely not. I highly doubt that we will see anything like this from E3 this year. Now, could we see something next year? Could we see something at the PlayStation Experience, at least a teaser, uh, at the end of the year, I do think that is possible. I think that's where we're going to be getting the bulk, uh, the the bulk, the bulk of the information uh, about PlayStation Five, and I think that in and of itself, at, at PlayStation Experience, is just going to be a teaser. But of course, you can keep it right here, tuned in, and we will cover all of the hottest gaming news as it comes out at E3 at PlayStation Experience, and of course, the YouTube channel, YouTube.com/slash Samuel Adams uh, Media. You can check that out over there, and uh, and we will be doing all of that good stuff. But that wraps it up for the main news stories of the day. However, I do want to go ahead and promote this. Uh, the Webby Awards are going on right now. This is the 22nd annual Webby Awards. The People's Voice uh, votes for what is going on on the internet. The best stuff, the worst stuff. They don't really vote for the worst stuff, but you know what I mean. And so, uh, the... the um, application that I use for podcasting is actually up for an award and right now it is in second place uh, with 16% of the vote now of course it's going to be very difficult to overcome HBO now uh, because obviously HBO now is HBO now and they can probably put a thing on their app where you can just link and go you know update and they can do some kind of free channel for a day giveaway or something like that but if you want to help me out you can head over here to uh, webbyawards.com and vote on Anchor.fm right here because they're incredible. They've helped me so much. I've been on their on the rise section with this podcast that you're watching right here for like a week and a half, which has been a fantastic experience, one that I'm so thankful for. And uh, it's awesome to see what they're bringing to the table over there on Anchor. I think it's going to be a revolutionary form of podcasting. If you want to make a podcast, you literally just have to talk on the phone. That is all you have to do. It is amazing. It is mind boggling. I am so thankful for the tech that it is bringing to the table. Uh, but with that being said, that essentially wraps it up for this week's episode, or today's episode, this week's episode. We have we have five of those, ladies and gents. We have five. Uh, but that wraps it up for today's episode of Caffeinate. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube later, please drop me a like down below if you enjoyed what I brought to the table. If you're on Anchor, favorite the podcast, give me some applause if you enjoyed what you heard. And of course, if you're listening anywhere else on the internet, find that rating button, regardless of where you are. And drop me a rating. Let me know what you think about the entire podcast. And uh, I appreciate you guys hanging out in the chat. I appreciate you guys hanging out online in comment sections. I appreciate you listening on wherever you may listen. But I will talk to you tomorrow morning. I will be live streaming again on Mixer.com slash Samuel Adams on and off uh, throughout the entire week. Uh, we're going to be live later on tonight. Probably diving back into some Far Cry 5 or perhaps some Halo 5 because I still want to dive back into my Xbox One that I got last week. And so we will be checking that out. I'll be doing stuff pretty much all the rest of the week, so keep your ear and eye, or both of them, you know, ears and eyes, tuned in to twitter.com slash pretty chill guy to keep up to date with everything that I do end up making. Had to get some snaps in there, get a little bit of, get a little bit of gusto, uh, but you have a good day, thank you for listening again, and I will talk to you soon, peace.